Ho, ho, hello. I'm Matt Parker. I'm Steve Mould. <laughs> I'm Helen Arney, and you are listening to a podcast of Unnecessary Detail, the show where facts come first, but detail is never far behind. And not far behind that detail is the festive cheer of this time of year, which we are not immune to, which is why this episode is going to be our Christmas special. That's why I'll be talking about mistletoe. That's why I have a song about a laboratory Christmas party. And I have the latest instalment in my multi-year nerdy Christmas tree saga. <laughs> Easy for you to say. You know it. <laughs> uh, so let's grab that pint of eggnog, or egg log, as Matt would have it, and let's get details. Steve, what festive detail do you have for us today? Well, on a previous episode of the podcast i talked about interesting seed dispersal mechanisms and i have a festive one i've got a couple more actually so i'll finish on the festive one but here's a couple more that i found as well the first one how many of these do you have i've got so many (laughs) this could be the whole podcast you're gonna become the seed dispersal guy (laughs) oh god i don't want to be that i also feel like the more you do the more keep appearing so it's like seed dispersal you're this is idea dispersal. The more you talk about, the more people send you yes. or you find out or like your internet serves you up like whenever you search for anything. So this is ultimate dispersal of ideas. But, you know, when you're desperate for video ideas like I am, <laughs> really, the topics that I do are just the ones that people send me. <laughs> so after this podcast episode goes out, it, I'm just seed guy from, from that <laughs> Amazing. point Amazing. Everyone <laughs> could help Steve with his Steve dispersal. Oh, it's it seed, <laughs> seed dispersal, <laughs> Steve dispersal knowledge. That's, dispersal. That's it doesn't the... work, Matt. It doesn't work. I think you need Pretty to. Pretty sure I made it work. The one that everyone is familiar with is fruit. That's the obvious one. It's a little packet of sugar that encourages a, usually a mammal to eat it. The seed passes through unharmed and it's deposited some distance away from the parent plant in a nice little packet of fertilizer. But interestingly, it doesn't always work like that. Some animals will actually digest the seeds on the way down. Obviously, the the plant isn't particularly happy with that. I'm anthropomorphizing the plant, as I've done before, and we've all realized that that's okay and we're happy with that. The plants don't mind. The plants don't (laughs) mind. They don't have a mind, so they don't mind. So, for example, the eared dove is a grainivore, so it eats seeds it digests the seeds so if you're for example a panic grass which is an interesting name or a common lamb's quarter or sour gum your seeds are eaten by the eared dove and for a long time the seeds are stored in the craw of the dove because the dove wants to digest those seeds later what what's a craw it's early on in the digestive tract and it's a little pouch for storing things that you want to digest later. Okay, throat pocket. Which is where the phrase, it gets stuck in my craw, comes from. So the ear dove isn't doing any dispersal, but the cougar that is a predator of the dove <laughs> does do the seed dispersal. So the cougar it. eats the doves. Craw and all. Craw and all. <laughs> <laughs> Before the seeds have left the crawl. But what eats the cougar? Nothing eats the cougar. <laughs> it's crawls all the way down. <laughs> the seeds have not yet been digested by the dove when it's eaten by the cougar. The seeds can survive the digestive tract of the cougar. The cougar poos out the seeds some large distance away from the parent plant. And there you have it. The seeds have been dispersed. Seed dispersal inception. Very Christmassy. <laughs> Very Christmassy. Yeah. It's like a to <laughs> <laughs> Um Poppies. Poppies the plant, you know, those beautiful red petals. After the flowers have gone away, you get this pod of poppy seeds. You may have seen it. At the top of this kind of ball, there's a kind of crown shaped thing. So the seeds are developing inside there. You know, those tiny black poppy seeds. Eventually, when the time's right, these little holes appear just underneath the crown. And if you give it a shake, you can hear it. It's like a rattle. The idea is you've got this seed pod and it's at the top of a really long stalk. So 
when the wind blows, the whole thing tips over, and the seeds fall out of those holes at the top, just underneath the crown. And because the stalk is so long, those seeds are dispersed far away from the parent plant because of the distance. One stalk's worth. <laughs> up to a stalk's radius away. Dispersed up to a stalk's radius away. Yeah, it's baby steps compared to like the hunting ground of a cougar. But step by step, you're going to get further and further away and you're going to spread、uh, the seeds further and further away from the host plant. The third one, this is the festive one. It's mistletoe. Mistletoe is amazing. There's something about mistletoe. It's not a plant in its own right or something. It only feeds off other plants.、Yeah. It doesn't exist without each other. It's a bit like us, but,、yeah. <laughs> a, a, but a plant. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a bit like us in terms of some of them are parasites. <laughs> no, no.、Um, <laughs> okay, that's not, that's not the、yeah. word I would have、yeah. selected, but <laughs> I don't think it's symbiotic. It's definitely not symbiotic. No, actually, hold on. No, this is interesting. The word symbiosis is often used incorrectly. Symbiosis is any interaction between two species. That's probably too broad, but roughly speaking, mutualism is when it benefits both species, and parasitism is when it benefits the parasite to the detriment of the host. But symbiosis is both categories, good and bad. So I'm correct on a technicality. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Which is fine by me. <laughs> If we keep this real vague, we're all going to agree. <laughs> so. Mistletoe is a parasite. It parasitizes trees, and actually, the apple tree in our garden is now dead because of the mistletoe infestation that it has. Wow! I definitely、oh, wow. take back everything I said. <laughs> It's okay. Death by Christmassy. Death, death by Christmas. I know it's very sad. We do have another apple tree that has fewer mistletoe. Apparently, we can we should be harvesting the mistletoe because you can get a lot of money for it. But who's got time for that? Anyway, how does the mistletoe get onto the branches of the tree? And this is the clever bit: those little white fruit, they're eaten by birds. So the birds they eat the fruit, and you might have noticed. I don't know if you ever squished. One of the little white fruit from a mistletoe. It's very sticky inside, and that's deliberate. When the bird does a poop later on with the seed inside, it gets stuck to the bird's bum. <laughs> so the bird needs to wipe its bum. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and it wipes its. It to go. <laughs> that's the true meaning of Christmas. <laughs> What? And so the bird wipes its bum. On the tree, the seed sticks to the tree, and it germinates, and it gets into the cracks in the bark, and, and that's how it gets gets into the tree. Because it got wedged in. It got wedged in, and I don't know. I guess that's why we, you know, kiss under the mistletoe. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> in conclusion. <laughs> it's very romantic. So next next time someone tries to kiss you under the mistletoe, just bear in mind. Previously, a bird wiped its bum on a tree for that to be able to happen. Happy Christmas! Have you got anything more festive than a bird wiping its bum, Matt? I think so. I'm <laughs> also I'm talking about logs. Okay. <laughs> The good news is, I'm back on my Christmas tradition of making an overly mathsy Christmas tree. Famously, a couple of years ago, I programmed my own Christmas tree lights, which I was very excited about. I got very upset that when you buy like LED Christmas lights, the, all the lighting effects follow the wire. I don't want the effects to go down the wire. I want them to follow the geometry of the tree. The geometry. That's <laughs> where I want the lighting effects to be. And so, I spent a very long time writing some terrible Python code. And this is a non-trivial task. I wired 500 LEDs、oh. in, a, in a continuous chain, but they need to have a, a constant like data signal through all of them. But they have a lot of power draw, and so I had to keep buying and blowing up power supplies off the internet. At one point, I was running around my house finding any power supply I could press gang into the Christmas tree. <laughs> Very sadly, burnt out the power supply for my kitchen scales. I was like, "Oh, this is the right voltage," and then I was like, "What's that smell?"、Aww. I love Matt how you're putting the Y into wired Christmas lights here. Hey, 
Yeah. Oh, <laughs> hey. The end result was it was worth. It. Well, you know, you know, I got shamed into it. Oh. So, your friend of mine, Eugenie von Tunzelman, VFX master, who um, she did a lot of the visual effects behind Interstellar, the film. Like incredible VFX person. She's come on our live evenings of unnecessary detail. She's come along and shown some of her making, programming. Like she had a robotic glockenspiel at one point. And I was having a call with her about something else. We're catching up. And she showed me a project she was working on, which was using individually addressable LEDs. And this was kind of early lockdown during 2020. And I said, oh, a couple of years ago, I bought like 50 individually addressable LEDs because I've always had this dream of one day programming my own Christmas tree lights to do effects that match the shape of the tree. And she was like, oh, well, I've got these spare bits. You'll need these. I can send you this guide so you can do that. And at that point, I was like, well, now I feel, you know, just socially obliged. Yeah. You'd be letting someone down if you didn't do it. Yeah, We wouldn't be able to book her for any more of our shows. She'd refuse as a person of principle. A lot of the stuff she's like, oh, well, I had to order 100 of these because I needed like 15. And she's, she's like, <laughs> I will send you, I will just post you the surplus components you're going to need so you can put your Christmas tree together. So at that point, I was like, well, I'm going to have to do it now. And so that's what kind of, uh, you know, socially pressured me into doing it. I did get it working in the end. So my computer would turn each of the LEDs on individually and then the webcam would register the brightest pixel, which would give me effectively X and Y coordinates of where that light was on the tree. So I didn't care where they were. I just chucked them on the tree, made sure I had good coverage, pointed the camera at it, and about an hour later, it will have turned them all on one at a time and recorded their X and Y coordinates, at which point I'd then rotate the tree 90 degrees to do the next side. <laughs> Oh, so you wanted it to be 3D. You didn't want to just have yep. one angle where nope. you can see an image, right? And right. since then, people have come out with Christmas tree lights that come with an app that can display patterns. But, and people, please do write in if I'm incorrect about this. As far as I'm aware, you're just projecting patterns on the surface. I wanted 3D, like, voxels. I wanted lights... Mm. I want to know the depth into the tree of every single light. I wanted to have an equal density of lights throughout the tree. And I want to be able to do 3D graphics on the tree. At this point, you're putting the unnecessary into the detail. Oh, and this this isn't even this year's tree. This is so long ago. <laughs> this is the setup. We are so hey, here for it. So I was so pleased. I got the whole thing working. Because then you have to scan it from multiple directions. So you can, because some of the lights are obscured by branches in some directions. There was a lot of error correction. And I had to do a bunch of it manually, which is a bit annoying. But then how do you know, like, I need to know the index of every single light. And they're all identical. And I didn't want to have to count along. So I wrote some troubleshooting code where they would all blink their position number in binary. <laughs> and so I could then just write down what number it was by looking at the blinks. I was very, very pleased. In hindsight, Morse code would have been quicker. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Would have Harder been. to pass in code, though. Well, exactly. Harder to parse in code. And I'm not fluent in Morse code. I am fluent in binary. So yes, I was, you know, repurposing existing skills. <laughs> now, the next year, I rewrote the code so it would calculate the Pythagorean distance between any two adjacent lights and compare that to the length of the wire. So I knew how long the wiring was between bulbs. And if I suddenly had one bulb over here, another one way over there... I'm like, one of them must be wrong. Like, I must have the coordinates wrong because they cannot physically be that far apart. Uh, and then I wrote code. because, But then you're like, but which one's right? And so I wrote a bunch of code that would process, like, the chain of distances and work out which ones were incorrect in my database based on what would be physically plausible on the tree. So I could autocorrect... <laughs> Now, it wasn't ideal because I then just assumed they were equally spaced. Like, I had a confidence of which ones I was pretty sure I had the coordinates right. And the ones that were wrong, I just put, like, equally spaced in between the nearest ones I was confident about, mm. which was good enough, but not perfect. I have ambitions for improving this code in future years. And this is also the tree where I then invited viewers, because I put this on my YouTube channel, and said, if you want to write some code for my tree, um, send it in, and I'll run it. 
um, on the tree. And then I, after Christmas, I spent it's an hour. It's an unedited one hour video on my second channel of me drinking a beer of an evening. I was baking bread like it was peak lock, lockdown three at that point in the UK. Uh, that video is now one of my most popular videos I've ever made. Of all the stuff I've put effort into, me just <laughs> running viewer's code unedited on my tree, 9 million views. Did anyone try to hack your tree? No. Someone did try to rickroll me. <laughs> okay, great. But my tree did not have the resolution nor refresh rate <laughs> for that to be possible. But someone wrote like 3D snake that would replay inside the tree like it was absolutely phenomenal i was very very pleased a design course at harvard got in touch they used it as a as an assignment for their students so my christmas tree got into harvard which i think is i'm very proud of it's had more academic achievement than i have that was like 2020 and 2021 was working on the tree and refining the code 2022 i took a year off i wasn't I uh, didn't have space sadly to, i was busy writing a book and all these things i didn't make a christmas tree whereas this year 2023, back with a Christmas tree vengeance. I have a Christmas tree. Matt, are you only doing this because you're looking for something to do instead of finishing your book? Correct. <laughs> I think you find I managed to include it in yeah. my book <laughs> as justification. <laughs> I've discovered over the years that writing Matt is fun, Matt. I get lots more messages on WhatsApp yeah. like, oh, have you seen this video on Instagram? You can make a video. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my house is a lot cleaner too. <laughs> No, it's because I got nerd sniped. I was meant to be writing my book. And someone shared a blog post about someone named Percy Ludgate, who I'd never heard of. It was a Irish mathematician in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And they designed a mechanical computer. They were way ahead of everyone. Except for Charles Babbage. They were the second. They, no one remembers the second. They were the second person of two to design what we would consider a computer. So a, some kind mm. of um, Turing complete device. The third one was electromechanical. So only right. two people ever designed. They weren't built, but in theory, they would have been fully working computers entirely analog without any electricity. Nice. And Percy was the other one. Famously, Charles Babbage in the 1800s. Ada Lovelace wrote up all the notes and wrote the first program that would run on it. And then Percy, around 1909, came up with a different design that worked totally separately to how Babbage's worked. And to do that, they had to come up with a table of numbers to convert multiplication into arithmetic, into adding. You, now you're thinking, well, they're going to use a, use log, a log table. table. Yeah. Classic log table. No. They handcrafted their own oh. artisan. Ha, wait, artisanal <laughs> artisan. Which one's the well and which one's the hipster? Uh, I think artisanal is hipster. Artisanal. They handcrafted their own artisanal log table from scratch. Wow. So um, who would like to do a multiplication? I will drive the table. But if you give me two two one-digit numbers you want to multiply, who, who would like to have a go? I'm going to go for seven. And I go for... Five. Okay, so if I look up seven in Ludgate's table, seven has an index of 33. So you've got to remember that, 33. Yeah. And Steve, five has an index of 23. So if you add those together, you get 56. Wasn't that lovely? Now you look up 56 in another table, and in, in entry number 56 is the value 35, which is the result of seven times five. Yeah. Witchcraft. <laughs> so instead of using a log table to look up your two numbers to get their logs that then you add and then you use a reverse log table to get back out again, Percy just made his own tables from hand that achieved the same thing. Wow. But their goal was to keep the numbers as small as possible. So yeah. the biggest number in their table is 50. So if you look up zero is... Index 50. And so if you want to do 0 times 0, not the most complicated calculation, you'd look up position 100, 50 plus 50, and sure enough, it is a 0. So it's what's very the clever. flaw here? Percy only did to 50, and there's only capacity in his system 
for that many numbers and not many more, whereas logarithm tables can go on and on and on. Yeah. Well, log tables could do, but not efficiently, was Percy only cared about the digits zero through nine. Whole numbers Mm. didn't, like log tables were great for multiplying either bigger numbers or numbers with a decimal point in them, which is pretty much the same thing in a log table. Percy, however, what they wanted to do was take bigger multiplication and split it into its individual components. And if you're multiplying two big numbers together, at each step along the journey, all you're doing is multiplying a one-digit number by another one-digit number. And you do have the mild issue of the carry, like you need to bump Mm. something over to the next calculation, which is one of the big sticking points in coming up with these analog computers was was the carry issue. And the way Percy wanted to implement this was it's a glorified version of having like rods, because if you're pushing something like with, with two rods that you're adding their lengths, and that was Percy's system for doing multiplication was pushing by two different lengths. They actually had like a weird kind of stepped bit of metal. And by multiplying two numbers, you'd select points on it and the distance it would push would match those numbers. And then you'd hit the readout. And so I was like, that's amazing. And then I realized two things. I realized, first of all, Percy had to do it by hand. I live in a post-computer world. So I can write some terrible Python code to find my own set of numbers so i found my own equivalent tables which are arguably better than percy's you seem so reluctant to say that (laughs) well it's because mine use smaller numbers so i achieve smaller numbers well done congratulations my table is all done it goes from zero to 84 so that's 85 entries whereas percy's goes to 100 zero to 100 it's actually 101 entries but Percy's highest non-zero entry is in position 66. It's all zeros after that. And so if they've got a way of building it such that the absence of a result counts as a zero, their system, strictly speaking, uses smaller numbers because all the zeros are at the end and you don't have to deal with them explicitly. Whereas my system, it will explicitly give you zero readouts if you need it to be able to do that, mine would technically be a more efficient way of doing it. Whereas if Percy's can handle them by default, his is a more efficient way of doing that. It depends it depends what you're building. Matt, you've used 120 years of computer technology to make something slightly more efficient in one direction, but not another. Correct. What's this got to do with Christmas trees? <laughs> well, then I realized, hang on, because I then built a computer using cogs that would implement my system. I had cogs with different numbers of teeth. And if you rotate them, that have the same number of teeth as their value in the table, that would move a big central cog. It would increment at the correct amount, and you'd have the readout as, as it rolls around. It has all the possible, the whole second table is on the middle cog, and it would read out the result by adding two cog rotations. You really didn't want to finish this book, did you? <laughs> but, oh my God, so sick of the book. But then, then I realized, hang on, if you want to add things, if you stack two things on top of each other... You're adding their heights. So what if I had a whole bunch of Christmas presents of very specific heights (laughs) such that if you stack two of them and they've got numbers on them, like if you stack the four one on top of the three one, their combined height would add to match a bauble on a Christmas tree upon which would be written their product. So I made the first table out of very specifically sized Christmas presents and then the second table was the heights of baubles on a Christmas tree. And we can share this. I've actually got, I did a digital version of this. So I'm holding up and we will we share this on the socials. There's a whole bunch of very specific height Christmas presents. And then if you stack them in front of this picture of a Christmas tree. <laughs> this is great. Any pair, including squaring them. If you have two the same and you put them on top of each other, you get their square. They all line up. And there's no duplications. They will line up with the appropriate bauble to read off their product. So I will share the main images. I will say this is my Christmas card I've sent out to all my Patreon supporters nice. this year. Is the the Christmas card like the physical version of this tree? So if not not to advertise on this podcast, but hypothetically, if people support me on Patreon, they get either emailed the full card or they get posted one, depending on your level of support. And I will, but I will link to the image if people want to have a look at the image for the show notes here. Don't tell my Patreon supporters so anyone can check it out and 
have a play. But then, then what happened was one of my office mates, like I, w- I was prototyping this in the office. I was cutting out the presence and having a play. And um, my office mate, Laura, looked at me and said, well, hang on. Why don't you make an actual tree that does this? And I said, well, I really should be getting back to my book. And then Laura <laughs> said, if I could give her the numbers for the card, I haven't done zero and one. I decided multiplying by zero and one was too trivial and and it simplifies the tree dramatically to make it a much smaller. And she said, well, why don't I give her a, a new version that goes from one to nine and she will actually wrap the presents and hang the baubles. And to Laura's incredible credit, and uh, she managed to convince her two kids, Carrie and Nina, to help out. They made the whole Christmas tree with suspended baubles all in very precise heights and presents all wrapped of very precise sizes such that the Christmas tree is a physical log table, which I am deeply pleased with. And so I will also share a photo of the functioning log table Christmas tree. Matt, can I just ask, how is this going to play out on Christmas Day with your family when everyone has put their Christmas (laughs) presents of very specific heights under the tree? There will be no unwrapping of the presents. Partly because I don't trust anyone to do it surgically enough to not alter the height of them. And also, to get all the right heights, Laura just had to grab all sorts of stuff from around her house. So I've just (laughs) inherited a bunch of her belongings that happen to be the right height. And I feel like, I mean, I feel like, number one, I can re-gift them back to her, but I suspect I can't gift them to anyone else. You've created something that people can say is a Yule log the Yule log. <laughs> Is that fair? Yule. Yule. <laughs> if you come to mine for Christmas, Yule log. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we got there. Okay. I'm very sorry. This episode is sponsored by Brilliant.org, the place to get your STEM skills up to speed via interactive lessons that don't just look good, they actually help you learn better. Over the years, I've realised that I learn so much more easily when I can see stuff, move it around and just mess about as I work out the answers. Brilliant is all about getting hands on with science and maths by actually doing it, not just watching it or reading about it. If there's a hot topic I need to get my head around quickly, like large language models or quantum computing, I'll turn to Brilliant and there's a course that takes me through it all step by step on the app or on my desktop computer. Brilliant makes it easy to keep learning and stay ahead of the curve with tons of real knowledge and problem solving practice. 15 minutes a day is all you need to master a whole new area of science or maths bit by bit. And it's a way better use of time than doom scrolling on social media. Get started now with a 30 day free trial. And if you love it and want to upgrade to annual premium membership, the first 200 unnecessary detail listeners will get 20 percent off. Follow the links in the show notes or visit our special URL at brilliant.org slash A-P-O-U-D. Now, I'm not the only one here with overly nerdy Christmas traditions. Helen. Yeah, we we have a few in our house. Most of them involve standing around the piano and singing, but but also... (laughs) Musical nerds. um, I made my husband, Rob, a a binary advent calendar once that had eight doors... Uh, that's great oh that's amazing so <laughs> but it ha- it was quite a lot of maintenance though you didn't preload the correct number of gifts per door but then what would be the surprise you'd have to you'd open the right drawers and yeah. then take one take one <laughs> yeah, and then no, they'd be like point, but which point. one and then you could they'd choose the wrong one so so i had to reload it every night that's which very it was the highest maintenance advent calendar but the rewards were great it was a lot of fun the containers, they couldn't be like little tiny holes. They had to be quite substantial. So, yeah, I made it out of a series of shoe boxes. <laughs> Was there one gift per hole? So, like, on the 15th, you're like, oh, my goodness. it's No, I had to have multiples. Like, yeah. maximum gifts. Yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like there's a really difficult-to-learn version of the 12 days of Christmas with this advent calendar <laughs> where each, the, the next day you have to remember which doors are open and you sing the things that are open from that day with those doors. Do you see what I mean? Do I'll work on that for 2024 next year. That is a fantastic idea for next year's song. This year's Christmas song, however, 
I already wrote several years ago. You were ahead of the curve. <laughs> it's a sort of anti-Christmas Christmas love song. And if you're wondering why it belongs on a podcast of unnecessary detail, it's because it takes a single line from a popular Christmas song by Wham and extrapolates that into an entirely new song of its own. I'd like to reassure anyone who is doing the Whamageddon thing that it contains no direct musical quotes from the song. So you won't be caught out. Don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Uh, right. I will just leave you to enjoy this song. This time last year at the laboratory Christmas party down the weather spoon. I gave you my heart But it's not like that song by Wham No ma'am, I promise You could have given it away The very next day And I wouldn't mind You could have sneaked into my chest Made a cardiac And that would be fine Well, it's been a year And I'm still working here Even though I said I wouldn't be And my crush on you is crushing me And like the coke machine in the canteen I'm empty inside Last week I asked to borrow a test tube Just to feel your hand in mine Tonight I'll stop this charade and ask you to dance with me to Slade and hope you'll say Fine Last year I said Hi my name's Jeff You said hi my name's Monica and I said hi again and pretended like I didn't already know your name (laughs) but I did and you didn't have to pretend because you genuinely didn't know my name and I tried to impress you and I gave you all my drink tokens And you used your drink tokens to buy yourself double vodkas And then you used my drink tokens to buy yourself double vodkas And then at 1am you tried to leave And you threw up in the corner of the car park And you said it was cool to share a taxi home But when I tried to get in your friend Sue said there wasn't enough room But there was definitely one seat next to you But Sue works in protein folding so I suppose she knows about that sort of thing You nodded at me as the taxi drove off But you might just have been nodding generally because you were losing consciousness at that point And that's the thing I like about you, Monica, you're so dignified Now the party's here We're standing with our beers by the pool table And you're holding hands with our supervisor, Steve Even though your Facebook status says you're single Why does the internet always lie you've been given a promotion you don't want my drink tokens i think my heart is broken i wish i had never spoken to you at last year's laboratory christmas party Well, that's it for this episode. If you're listening to this in December or another December in the future, happy Christmas. If it's any time of year other than December, we're very sorry. And whatever the season, don't forget the true meaning of Christmas, which is that this podcast is part of the ACAST Creator Network. And we're very happy about that, don't forget. We are happy. We're very proud of that. If you want even more details, check out the show notes. They're also available at festivalofthespokennerd.com forward slash podcast. You'll find more links to things we mentioned in the show and more about where you can find Helen's songs, Matt's new book and my new videos and stuff. If it's gifting season for you, there's plenty of last minute Christmas gifts on our website. From downloads of our three filmed tour shows to downloads of our BBC Radio 4 series, Domestic Science. I mean, it's mostly downloads. They just really work really well as last minute gifts, don't they? And don't forget all the songs featured on this podcast are free at my Bandcamp page. 
page if you are both last minute and cheap. Links to all that are in the show notes. And if you're in the UK, our next live shows are on sale at festivalofthespokennerd.com. Show tickets make great gifts as well, don't they? Yes, true. And if you want to give us a gift with more unnecessary detail of your own, you can get in touch at podcast at festivalofthespokennerd.com. Com. That's our email, and we're on all the social media as Festival of the Spoken Nerds. So come along, say hi, and give us some detail. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Christmas. Bye. Bye. Our podcast of Unnecessary Detail is made by Festival of the Spoken Nerd. That's Helen Arney, Steve Mould, and me, Matt Parker. This episode was produced by Laura Grimshaw. Our theme music is by Howard Carter. And what we're most proud of in the world is being part of the ACAST Creator Network. Thank you for listening. <laughs>